Patrick Donahoe, welcome to capitalism.com. It is a pleasure to be here. You have an amazing place. This reminds me of where I grew up and uh, all the nostalgia is like flooding into my body. <laughs> I'm glad. I'm glad. <laughs> uh, I'd like to start some of these off with a simple question. Patrick, how did you make your money? Wow. Um, that's, a, that's a loaded question. Thanks for the prep. You know, the prep <laughs> time for this. Uh, you know, I connected something. I don't know when it was, but I connected the dots between uh, value and money. And I think it was, it was because I started my business just prior to 2008, 2009. And, and I was like really successful out of the gate. Like we started in 2007. And what's the business? Well. Like what, where is money coming from? This is uh, financial financial services, mm -hmm. right? We were doing uh, insurance, financial strategy, pretty much the same thing we're doing right now. But I got everything handed to me because I was part of a partnership and they lost everything and took me down with them. And I was like on the, my wife was like telling me, go get a job at 7-Eleven. I still remember like her in tears, like get a job at 7-Eleven. Like, I'm, I'm sick of this. And I was that I was that close. We had like a moving van ready to go to Phoenix, where she's from, uh, where her family's was living. We had a place to stay there in someone's basement. Like I was just gonna hit the reset button, and it, and I you know went through just a you know whether it's prayer or meditation or just huge introspection, and and I was starting to connect the dots with things that I believed, and that's where it hit me, where it's like what you have. And I tell the story in the in the book that I wrote, but it's what you have people need it would have it would have helped during the financial crisis it would have made you know a lot of successful people had they had the mentality and had they had the strategies and so that's when i basically said i'm gonna i'm gonna make it work and from that point forward it wasn't about necessarily money although i wanted money and i wanted to make money i wanted to achieve certain things but it came down to figuring out the way to make uh make people's lives change through constantly finding ways to create value for them. Yeah, so I I mean, I obviously know that you're in financial services. I I just have you in my mind as like, you're you're the guy who manages the world's, you, you at least know and implement the strategy of the world's wealthiest people, which mm -hmm. we'll talk about. And you've been doing that, I know, since like right after the, the Great Recession. Is that what or you were before. doing? That's what you were doing before. Oh yeah, this was 2000. This was like the beginning of 2007. Got it, So you so you had a partner that you were in this business with that brought it down. Yeah, there was a couple of couple of partners. And you went out on your own yeah. after that. And I settled, like I had to buy them out and I got a database and a lot of debt. And I didn't know how I was gonna pay it back, but I had a database. And so I started doing webinars. And I just did, dude, I did webinars before like people knew what webinars yeah. were. And I kept doing the podcast. I remember I was only doing a podcast like once a month. Cause dude, getting the gumption to actually be confident enough to interview somebody or talk about certain things was was hard. I felt inauthentic most of the time. So I was digging out of my own crap. And what did it take to turn that around? It was the, it was tenacity first first and foremost and it was commitment to not failing. Like I was a person that grew up playing sports and I was like I'm not going to I'm not going to fail. This is something I'm going to figure out. I'm not going to hit the reset button. And I look back and I was like, you know, I, I could have and I probably would have accelerated the process, uh, but I didn't file bankruptcy. I settled all my debts. I paid back like almost a million dollars. Wow. And, How old were and you? I figured out. Uh, so this was like early 30s. Yeah, that's that's a lot. Actually, when was so it? Was 2000. <laughs> yeah, it was, I in 2008 I turned 30. So, yeah, that's that's a lot, Patrick. Um, Dude, it was, yeah, I, mean, well, it was, I actually I actually didn't know that part of the story. So yeah. so ten years later, I mean, you have you have basically you as far as I know, you're you're the guy that a lot of my peers go to to implement all mm -hmm. of the financial strategies of the world's wealthiest people. Like mm -hmm. our our membership is the one percent. One percenters kind of go to you to to implement a lot of the strategies. Yeah, and I've told you, you know, my my two steps to wealth: build a business and invest the profits. Mm -hmm. I am all in on my businesses. I yeah. then invest into cash flowing, uh, real estate cash flowing, dividend paying stock, other investments that pay me cash flow. Mm -hmm. But you're a little bit more strategic than that. Yeah. And so I was hoping you could kind of walk us through what the overall strategy looks like when you're when you're in, when you're investing in these higher level. Well, I first I first step back because I I really believe that mindset will dictate your success. Because having a lot of money does not mean that you're going to be wealthy. I know that sounds cliche. Uh, I, I've just seen it firsthand so many times 
with I actually people. don't think I'm sorry to cut you off, but I don't think that's cliche at all. What do you mean when you say that having a lot of money does not mean that you're wealthy? Money's like paper and ink. <laughs> it is. It's like people have this notion that there's value in money and there's and there's not. Right, the money is in actually the values and what people do with with the money. But the funny, dude, the funny thing is, it's like we're so conditioned as a society to think that money has value that people figure out a way to not spend it. Like they defer it, and they do, you know, yeah. IRAs deferring until they're you know retired, and then they stretch it so that they don't have to pay any taxes on it. It's like, so I, and I know, I know, tax strategy is is vital, right? But in the end, it's like pay the tax and spend the money. If you're wealthy, because that you know what you spend it on is what people are after, but yet they never do it. And so that's where I looked at. You know, I think it's it's telling to do business with older individuals, and I, I say older, uh, probably past the age of, of 65. And I, I know a lot of 65 year olds that live a hell of a better life, a vital life than those that are in their 30s, right? But still, it's like those that are at 65. That's this is like this golden age, right? Where you're at 65. And suddenly, life is supposed to start. I mean, what's wrong? What's wrong with that, right? It's it's this idea that you know there's this future waiting for you because we've been socially conditioned yeah. to think that these are the things that we should be doing. And I think there's just a lot of social. They're not lies, but there's so much social ignorance out there when it comes to money and why you're doing what you're doing. If I make a lot of money, it's like then I'm going to be able to do something. Well, figure out what you're going to do. Commit yourself to doing that. And then the strategy takes hold, and now you can plan for that. But if you don't kind of understand really what you want in the end, then no financial strategy is going to make you happy. So I look at you know older individuals. You know, I was telling you a story uh, earlier where I had this this uh, I have this client, and it's, you know, I have a couple of his uh, family members as well. Uh, but he's a neurosurgeon, super smart guy, right? He has all these different patents and procedures. Like it's it, it's incredible. But he's on his third marriage. Right, and he wants to set up this legacy for his kids and his grandkids, who he doesn't even have a re- have a relationship with, right? So he wants to leave this money to them and and leave it in a certain way, right? Where they essentially have access to all of this money, but they have to do certain things to get it. And I'm just, I, and I was like, it it would boil my blood, right? Because like your legacy really is meant to be established while you're alive, mm. not while not when you're not when you're passed on. And it's the establishing relationships with your kids and grandkids should be a priority if you really want to benefit them in the long run. So his challenge was way more personal than it was financial. In the end, that's where I you know kind of connect the dots between everything is personal, even money. So and it really comes down to number one, establishing like what what you really want, right? And if money is the solution to what you want, I try to go deeper with people. Why do you want it? What's the reason behind it, okay? And then look at their behaviors up to this point and figure out, you know, are they gonna be able to actually achieve that? And this is where I think with, you know, entrepreneurs and smaller smaller business owners that achieve a certain level of success, I think introspection first and foremost about their business and what they really want in the end is more important than actually figuring out where to invest Mm. profits. And then the investment is going to have an objective. The business has an objective. The investments have to have an objective as well. So I hate how you answer that question. Sorry. Um, because, because, <laughs> because figuring out what you want, in my experience, figuring out what you want is a lot harder than figuring out what to invest in. And so I guess my, my next question is, does anybody really know what they want? Uh, <laughs> I think there are, it, that's a great question, right? And I think people, if they introspect long enough, Right, they can figure out why they're doing what they're doing, right? And I think in the end, everybody wants the same thing. People want to be happy. They want to have good experiences. They want to establish good memories, right? They want to do fun things, right? You, you are a, a Tony Robbins uh, guy. Uh, you've been to some of his events. I just came back from you know an event, so a lot of this stuff is like fresh on my mind. Right, but we we have needs. We have things that we're trying to pursue. There's things that are driving us. Right, you have the six basic needs, and I look at really what the infinite game is that Simon Sinek talks about, and it's the idea behind growing. And I think you get to the point where you recognize that growth is an infinite game. There isn't like retirement, even though we all think that 
you know, I'm gonna retire one day. Retires and retirement is anti-life. Human beings are not meant mm -hmm. to not do. It kills, it'll kill you. The idea though is to grow in ways that you know, maximize your experience of life and ultimately contribute the most to society. And that could be through building business. It could be through, you know, establishing a ton of wealth and transforming your family's life, transforming your community's life. And I really look at the wealthiest individuals and that pivot between where they're at and really where they wanna be is they start recognizing those two principles, those two, you know, they're called the spiritual needs where you are, you're adamant about growing you recognize that you have to do that for the rest of your life. And also the fulfillment you receive by actually benefiting others, creating value for others. So what I'm hearing you say is that you're identifying these pieces for the individual first before you're ever deciding which magical whiz bang investment strategy totally to deploy. Is, is that fair? For sure. But I, I imagine that there's like a, a menu of options that you are picking from when you are crafting the overall strategy. Would yeah. you walk us through some of those? Yeah, I think th they're not necessarily uh, products or strategies. I think they're stages, right? I look at I look at kind of financial life in a f uh, four different stages, right? I think the first stage is like certainty, right? Certainty is when you have, you know, I would say some of the checklist items usually are, you have no consumer debt, uh, you have adequate reserves, and you're saving a healthy amount of money, right? I call that kind of the, the certainty foundation. Mm -hmm. Then you get to vitality, right? And the vi vitality stage of life really is when you start to connect the dots between how you make money and who you are, right? It's not a nine to five, it's not a job, right? It's more of a calling. You're saving more money, right? And you also are you know, essentially having a fulfilling lifestyle. Right? So I think that vi vitality space and the certainty space right, are the two predominant places that I find people. Mm -hmm. And then you have the financial uh, independence and then financial freedom. I think freedom and independence are much different. So I'd love to go into that, but sure. first, I can't imagine that most people come to you when they're in stage one and two, when they're, when they're figuring out their You'd secure. be surprised. You'd be really surprised. Right, so you, you work with some of the world's wealthiest people. They yeah. can't be coming to you looking for security. You'd be surprised. Tell me more. People are afraid, man. It's like, you know, if, if there's people that have a million bucks in the bank, right? And are afraid of spending it. It's crazy. It's crazy. And, I, and I think that just the conditioning of human beings, and this may not be the case for young people that don't have that. It's like when you're there and you experience that, it's like, and I don't, I don't, I didn't necessarily experience it. I experienced their experience of it but just the fear that exists of them spending it, buying a bigger home, going on a vacation, uh, doing stuff with their kids, spending money. People have the hardest time spending money when they are up or in that upper echelon. It's insane. You're, you're saying that when people are really rich, they're actually more risk averse <laughs> when it comes to spending money. I would say spending averse. And do you, ever, do you have any idea why that is? I think because they have connected the dots between fulfillment being a lot of money, not having a lot of money means I can do the things that fulfill me. Say that one more time. I don't remember what I said. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so well, let me ask you this then: when when you are when you are working with a high net worth person, what's what's the you're you're filling that first bucket of security, which is I mean that can't be much more than like a plan you give them, or is there something else that you're doing? Well. It de well, it depends, it's subjective, right? So it depends on the individual and where, where they're at. I think, I think these stages of life is more of a mindset, right, than it is checking boxes, okay? If you're, if you're not living, a, you know, at least going on vacation or doing nice things, then you're not, you're not you, can't educate, you can't graduate from the vitality stage of life. So when somebody, uh, I guess what I'm getting at, Patrick, is like, what do you do for these people? <laughs> when, when they're coming to you, like I, I get them. I really expect you to them come in, discover what they want, and then I help them get what they want. So I really expect you to come in with like this, with kind of the the strategy you walk somebody through when they're when they're a high net worth person. And I keep waiting for you to tell me that. And what I, what I'm hearing more from you is that most people come in with like a lot going on and they don't really know what they want or where they want to go. Mm -hmm. And it's your job to go in and figure out the financial strategy that is yeah. going to 
work for that person specifically. 100%. And I look at, you, you do have these blind spots that people have when it comes to uh, finances. And I think that these days, especially with business owners, there is a uh, tremendous uh, liability out there. And so also as part of that whole foundational strategy, right, it's, you know, cr creating kind of mirrors so they can see their blind spots. One specifically is cybersecurity has become an inc incredible, it's, it's bankrupted municipalities, it's bankrupted companies, right, with security breaches to a database, right? And so just a, a simple cybersecurity insurance policy or ensuring that your captive has cybersecurity insurance built into it. I mean, th those are just simple blind spots that most people are not aware of. You mentioned captive. I assume you mean a captive insurance plan. Yeah, is that, yeah. Would you walk people through what that is? Captive insurance companies is basically, you know, there's a number of different ways to establish it. You can establish your own, which was kind of the, the first one. That's where all these big companies do is they form their own insurance companies. They pay premiums that are essentially tax deductible income going to the captives you know, from premiums isn't isn't taxed because it's surplus. And then you have insurable events that like an actuary or an insurance creator uh, makes specifically for your business. So if something happens to your business, then your insurance company, okay, will indemnify that loss or like they'll, they'll yeah. send the company money if there's an insurable event. So cybersecurity, right? So let's say you pay a million dollars into this captive insurance company as a premium. And one of the things that it covers is captive insurance, right? So when the money comes out, it's also tax free, right? So let's say you have a breach and you have to pay this, you know, forensic database analyzer, right? All of this money to, you know, go through and ensure that the breaches, you know, or where the breach is extended to so that you know how to identify your, you know, your customers like Target, like Target had Target Marriott. I mean, it's insane. Like these big companies, right? They had breaches and, you know, huge amounts of money that they had to actually pay because there's laws right, where you have to hold a certain amount of insurance or you have to do certain things if your database, if the database is breached. So so, so, so anyway, uh, that's the idea. So like, a, a captive is an insurance company that you, you own. Create, uh -huh. And it, then this is not something for just Targets and Marriott. This is this is a, a lot of entrepreneurs our size yeah. set up at, for two reasons. One, and correct me if I'm wrong, because mm -hmm. um, I'm just interested in this stuff. Yeah. Uh, my old business partner set one up for himself, but but and you set it up to insure against certain events like mm -hmm. cybersecurity attack. Mm -hmm. But also I know people use them as kind of a tax. Yeah. I, I'm not allowed to use the word loophole. So yeah. I won't and say loophole. You, you have to use it for a legitimate purpose, right? Because most people that have captives are gonna get audited, right? So you have to you know, essentially prove that what the captive is insuring is in essence a, a, an event that will be detrimental to your business yeah, or, affect, but, or affect your business. But, but, an, but a Google algorithm change or a cybersecurity attack or an Amazon change mm -hmm. or tariffs in China yeah. could all be for sure. It could all be risks that you could insure. Yeah. And so am, am I correct in my understanding that people will set up these these insurance policies, these captives mm -hmm. within their businesses? And then they they basically it's they a can, separate business. Correct. Yeah. yeah. But they can they can take cash from one business, have a policy that is now stored away tax free, and you mm -hmm. can invest it mm -hmm. within the captive, mm -hmm. and you keep it there for insurable events. Yeah. Like a partner's death, yeah. a partner dispute, mm -hmm. and then that is when the money actually gets transferred back into the business, yep. depending on what the things that you have set up. Yeah, so captives, if you, if you do your own, it'll be absolutely specific to your company. But there are a lot of groups these days that make it more feasible because setting one up is really expensive. Plus you have annual maintenance on it, uh, which is also expensive. Now it's relative to the business size. So what you find is that you have co uh, companies that will actually uh, both own the company or multiple companies that will own the, the captive mm. insurance company, right? And that makes it a little bit more cost effective. However, you know, the actuarials, you know, have to be done in a way where it indemnifies all the companies involved. Uh, you anyway, to, you just, you just I don't want to get into a jargon. A three syllable It's word, just like, so it, I... it's a way to have, you know, a protection to your company, right? For different things that could disrupt it with a lot of tax benefits. Yeah, so, uh, I mean, do you, is that one of the things that you help set, set up for So, my, So I look at, it, I try to stay in my lane, 
right? It's like I specialize in, in certain things and I have just an amazing network of people that you know provide those type of services. So that's, uh, that's one area that I think not a lot of entrepreneurs know about is that they can set up that as part of their security bucket mm-hmm. right? and, and having access to cash that they would essentially control in the yeah. event of downside, yep. in the event of, of something, something going wrong. Mm-hmm. Uh, what, at a certain level, and that's what I realize it's like, it's a strategy and it's a strategy if you're at a, a, certain, a certain level. What, what else, what other tools in your tool belt are you, are you deploying? The tools in my tool belt? Yeah. Uh, so what are you specifically looking for? Like yeah, what, for, for if you were for, to talk about your audience, like what are some of the things your audience you know, is, is facing? What are the things that they're looking to as far as what to, what to create as a lifestyle, so what to create with yeah, their I business? Mean, I think the perception, and, and I have this perception still, is I think we all assume that passive cash flow equals freedom. And that if you've got predictable passive cash flow coming in that exceeds your expenses, mm-hmm. you can define life on your own terms. Mm-hmm. I find the hard part is the defining what life on your own terms looks yeah. like. But I also would challenge freedom because freedom is not passive income exceeding expenses. Freedom is a mindset. You can be free without that. I agree anyway, with you. It's I, one of those I agree like because I, I know a lot of people that make <laughs> way more than they spend right passively. But yet they're not they're not free. So I look at let's let's on one thing. So I would think for entrepreneurs and business owners is having a you know a, at least a bookkeeper, a controller, a CFO, right is is vital, right? Because those are you know the accountants and the mindset of an entrepreneur is typically not the mindset of an accountant, except if you're if you're Tom Wheelwright, right? <laughs> but he's not really an accountant; he's an entrepreneur, you know. But you look at really at, you know how your business operates, what its success is, and Surprisingly, a lot of business owners, especially if you're, you know, one owner, you look at your bank account as the barometer, right? Yes. To, to the success of your business. Yes. So a bookkeeper, we have a great relationship with a, a company that you know, is a, a, a virtual CFO slash bookkeeper so that you have essentially an idea of how, you know, how your business is doing objectively, not just looking at this, that, or the other. Yeah. So when somebody is coming to you, and they're, I mean, your, your typical client sounds like they're a high net worth person who's got things all over the place and they're saying, can you help me predict, or can you help me create a system that is more predictable yeah. uh, and develop more wealth and cash flow? Yeah. I think, I'd say this, I'll say it this way. So um, who, who's, who's a person's worst enemy? Who's their themselves. own worst, all their all own worst enemy, right? And so when it comes down to it, you know, the gap between what a person wants and, or a gap between where a person is and what a person wants is typically two things, right? Number one, it's ignorance, okay? Ignorance is a lack of, lack of knowledge. So it's about finding someone or learning, you know, what, what it takes. Uh, but, but the second part of it, which is the predominant one, is uh, the discipline to actually uh, execute, right? So if you look at, you know, how, how I look at clients and their situation is, is it a function of uh, ignorance or is it a function of discipline and the ability to execute. And there's so much, dude, there's information everywhere. People, I think, can go find what it takes to make more money. And it, it just comes down to the doing, the yeah. doing part. Yeah, ag- agreed. So, um, Patrick, I guess I'm just dancing around uh, like the question. When I know you, you want all the tactics and strategies, I do. dude. I, that's the thing, that's but stuff, like, to me, there's, there, there's a million of them, dude, and there's, there's ways in which you can, you know, value IP of a company and, you know, sell it to your kids and have a kind of an inter-family sale and turn your ordinary income into, into uh, you know, capital gains. I'm right? already so in. Yeah, so it's one of those, I'm, like, I'm I know, but, here, but here's what you realize. It's like, to, to me, it's important, right? But what's more important is, is why you would do that, right? And what's the outcome of, of you know the the tax savings right or the cash flow that you that you have because these days I think most entrepreneurs like have uh, what it takes to be really happy but they're not. I think that's very insightful of you. Um, I have to ask why you think that is. Exper- it's the, it's the experience and I think it's also social conditioning. You know we what have we been taught about money? Like what has society taught you about money? I know you have a totally different mindset, but it's still there, man. It's like, it's in you, 
what you should do and what you shouldn't do, even though it kind of conflicts with what you believe, like what it's still it's still in me, right? So what do we talk about money? I mean, the one that jumps out at me is like that people think that money is the root of all evil. Money's evil, okay. Yeah. What else? Uh, rich people are bad. Yeah. What else? Uh, the money is freedom. Uh, but are we really money, taught that socially? I yeah, I, I would say I was mm-hmm. right? that money equals freedom, but that m- making money is also hard. Mm-hmm. Uh, high risk that, got equals high returns. Sure, mm-hmm. that money and time are correlated. It's mm-hmm. a great one. <laughs> we can do a whole like thing on that. We could, yeah, we could. That's actually that's a profound one. Maybe we should do. Maybe we should do that. Here's the thing: it's like the, that inside of us prevents us from taking action, right? So it's adre- it's addressing those, right? And it's defining what freedom is. It's defining what time is. It's defining what your business is. I think some of the best and I think all investment is people. Either you or somebody else, because you're either going to do something with it or somebody else is going right. to do something with it. Right. Okay. So, from a business owner perspective, if you know you're, if you want to grow as a business, what do you have to become? Better business yeah. person, right? You need to. Under, what, what's what are aspects of a business that you see most people don't get? <laughs> uh, I think the biggest one is people forget that. Business is about value creation for customers, Mm -hmm. not about plugging into the right system that creates a bunch of money. For sure. (laughs) And most people don't go into a business that that way, right? They ultimately learn that, okay? Uh, But but that is is true. So one thing that I uh, was, was, it was awesome that you wrote a vision. You wrote, this is where I wanna be. Yeah. At the end of, of all the things I looked at, that is what compelled me the most, right? Because I've realized just with looking at business, looking at other people's business, looking at their lives, right? There isn't vision. The vision is like, you know, six feet, six inches in front of them, right? The vision isn't a year, two years, three years, five years, right? Now you may not hit that, okay? But you need to have a trajectory of where you're going. We all need an aim. For sure. We, 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 and, and man, I, I am shocked. Like, I think that I am sometimes weak at setting an aim and going for it. And I think I'm better than most people. Why is that? Why is that? Why am I better than most people? No, why well, Why do you set an aim and don't think you can actually get it? No, 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 it's not that. Okay. It's it's that I think it's part of the, like the hardest thing that I do is deciding what is an ideal or what is, what is a worthy aim. What is a, there's, we could do anything we want yeah. in today's world. Everything is accessible. Mm-hmm. Choosing what is worthwhile cutting everything else mm-hmm. and going after Burning the that. Boats. Yeah. Yeah. That that to me is half half of freedom mm-hmm. is deciding what's worth pursuing. Mm-hmm. What what is worth going after. And then I think kind of the numbers and all that sort of just play out mm-hmm. as long as it's a worthwhile pursuit. Yep. So so let me I, ask you a question. Yeah. Would you knowing about the worthwhile pursuit of another business be important before you invested in that business? Hundred percent. Or the person that's taking your money and investing. Yes, a hundred percent. That's the thing that hit me, and I see I I see a lot of it these days. That was really insightful. Right? Two thousand eight. I'm, I'm sorry. I, I I have to give context to this because yeah. I see so many business proposals from people who <laughs> want to be invested in. Yeah. I see so much uh, people who talk about how they're killing it. And, and so the temptation is to follow the numbers or to evaluate it logically. But, but I have, I've said it and this has stuck among my peers is I say that you're missing soul here. <laughs> and like, there's like, there's a, there's a missing reason. Uh-huh. There's a missing purpose behind it where if all of the numbers fell away, is there something else there that still matters? Well, and numbers I, measure something, dude. Correct. Like, what, what is it measuring? Yeah, it's it's measuring value that other for other people, mm-hmm. and I think most people see that as the end game, but it's really the byproduct. Yeah. And when you're investing in something, I think you're investing in the central reason why the business exists in the first place. Uh-huh. Because if the numbers don't work this quarter, this year. There's still some core value there that is eventually going to lead to profit. But why would it lead to profit? What is the what's that catalyst? Because other people value it enough to be able to spend money on. What else? Uh, what was the question? Like what is the catalyst? <laughs> what is the what is the catalyst to eventually making it? I, I I think I think it's just that people 
value it. That, yeah. that there's that there's they want it more than they want the dollars. Yeah. Where do you get? And that? I would add, I would add that it's the people that are running the company that are doing oh, it. Oh, sure. Right. And what they're doing, why they're doing it, what are they after? And that's where I look at 2008, 2009. And I, you know, there was some investment that I partnered with, you know, um, 2005, six, seven, and part of the partnership that I was, I was in also invested and I personally guaranteed stuff. And that's where, you know, I, I lost a lot of money. And it wasn't because the idea was bad. It was that the people were bad. Now, or, or that the people were short-sighted. Profit that, and that's what I was about. That was what I was about to say. In, were they? Did they have bad principles and were evil people? No. Um, but I looked at their experience, right? And I looked at their values, and I believe that they were in conflict, right, with their actual business value proposition. And I and I see it today. There's a lot of people raising a lot of money. There's trillions of dollars circulating out there, and I see it. You know, I'm in Salt Lake, right? And there's a, a lot of other like tech hubs, right? But there are tech companies uh, everywhere. None of them make any money, right? They're all spending more than they make with the hope that one day they'll make money. And I know that there's a whole business model there. Yeah. I, I had I my neighbor uh, is like the the lead developer for Carta, right? And they do all. Yeah. You know, Carta is it, and it, it, and he was like, no, that's not how cap tables work. If you look at this capitalization strategy, I'm just like, okay, whatever. Okay, I, I get it, right? But it, but in the end, it's like, these are these are companies that are, that are people being run by people, right? For what end, for what purpose, right? And that I think allows you to ask the questions that are typically not asked. Now you're gonna wanna look at their financials, you're gonna wanna look at you know the direction they're going, their partnerships, their contract. I get all of that, but people skip over the, people skip over the people part. Due diligence skips over the people part. Mm-hmm. And that's where I look at, you know, the. I don't invest with many uh, people. I, I mostly invest in, you know, stuff that I control, right? Which is mostly uh, real estate based. And then I uh, give money to people who I know. I know their values. I know what they've done in two thousand eight and two thousand nine when when shit went went sideways. And and I've seen other things that have gone sideways and what they did. I always look for that. If some if I will never. I mean, this is just me, and I might be short sighted. I will never invest in someone that has not lost any money. So hmm. I want to know. I want to know what happens when things go wrong, because it, eventually something always goes wrong. It does. Like we were talking yeah. downstairs, it's like it's the S curve, right? Right now we're in this like huge like, grow, 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 Ooh, grow, grow. Yeah, are we ever? But no tree grows to the sky, right? No economy grows to infinity. I mean, it, there's going to be correction. It's 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 economics. It's math. It's math. Like that's how innovation occurs. And we're human beings. We're innovators. We're always finding better ways to do things, which unfortunately displaces the stuff that was doing that job previously, right? Yeah. So uh, it sounds like you have a kind of a similar investment strategy to me, which is I used to try, like, I, I used to own a, a nice portfolio of single family houses. Our mutual friend, Jason Hartman, mm-hmm. will stand up on uh, on a soapbox and say it's the number one asset class in the world. He's done really well with obviously. it. <laughs> yeah, obviously, <laughs> obviously he's biased with it, but, but uh, I used to have a nice portfolio. I don't do that anymore. You know, I'm not gonna compete with the people who are doing that full-time and professionally. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I give my money to the people who are doing that full-time as a yes, business, absolutely. right? Absolutely. And I'm gonna, get a, I'm gonna get a piece of that action, absolutely. right? I, I think a mutual friend of mine, uh, of ours, JP Newman, is, mm-hmm. is, is the same thing, right? So it does commercial properties mm-hmm. rather than me try to be a commercial investor. I'm going to give it to the group that does. So, yep. and this is like where the, that's what you mean by evaluating people. And uh, yes, because it's not the same thing. Okay, because what's not the same thing? Doing when you're it yourself. Inve- when you're doing it yourself, right, and you're giving money to somebody else to do it for you is not the same thing. I 100 percent agree. Yeah, because you're giving it to somebody else, right, and. There's obviously profit, there's business there for them. Okay, it's, it's clear at the same time, you know, what are their values? What are they after? You know, when, when dis, you know, what are their systems, like business systems? Like it's amazing, Tom, Tom Wright taught me this. He said that most businesses fail at about uh, 30 employees, right? Once you get to like 30 employees, full-time employees, okay, that's when businesses fall apart. I think 30, he said 30 to 50 or something like that. But the principle was, when you build to like 30, 30 employees, right? You can get away with all sorts of crap, right? You can get away with not having systems. You can get away <laughs> with, you feel, you know, if you're the CEO or the, you know, I'm not a CEO of like a company of 30, I don't know. There's no need for a CEO at a company of 30 typically. Anyway, that's another story. But <laughs> the idea is like, you know, CEO is doing the job of the controller, right? Or, or CEO is doing the job of the salesperson or CEO is doing the job. 
Yeah, it's one. It's one of those things where business systems, right? And, I, and these are other just things that are overlooked. How to you know how to read a business plan, right? How to understand SOPs, how to understand a business flow and a sales flow. I was never taught that. I was never taught that, right? But I paid the price of not having it. Yeah. And, then, <laughs> and I paid the price of not having you know systems. I paid the price of you know not thinking that my employee handbook had any value. <laughs> oh man. Yeah, if, you, if your employee handbook is off the shelf handbook, like you're gonna get screwed, you're gonna get sued, and you have to pay a lot of money. You know, so anyway, there's, it's, one of those, it's one of those things where as a business owner, if you're building a business, right, the principles that make a business successful, right, are what you wanna look for in other businesses that you're investing in. Yeah, so, um, I mean, what, what I'm basically hearing you say, and I, I'm hearing in my own context, my own filter, so, which is, I am all in on my businesses and then I'm looking for other relationships of people who run businesses mm -hmm. that spit off cash flow for me. Mm -hmm. and, and sometimes that's real estate. Sometimes that is other, in my world, e-commerce businesses. Mm -hmm. Sometimes that's other unrelated businesses. So is, is your general, I guess, thesis mostly the same? Every, everything that has to do with money is, is is people has involves people, <laughs> right? And so, and that's where I look at the uh, failure, demise, no returns, all comes down to people. It really does. There's there's successful businesses everywhere. There's been successful businesses for hundreds of years, right? And so, when a business, so why does a business fail if we have all these examples of successful businesses? <laughs> I mean, some would say timing, some would say economic changes, some would say technology. Okay, some... so who's a company that, you know, maybe got, they were early on timing, but still made, but still were successful? Uh, I would say Tesla was early on timing. And yeah. I, guess, I guess we would debate whether or not they're successful. Uh, I would say they are. Yeah, Apple. Yeah. Right, so it's one, it's one of those things where, so, why, why were they successful? <laughs> I mean, for, both, their timing was for early. both of those companies, they had a very central thesis. Like mm -hmm. They had a very central mission mm -hmm. that they were building. Like you brought up Apple as an example. Mm -hmm. I mean, Apple didn't really hit it big until the iPod. That was, that was the thing that really went mass market. Mm -hmm. But th that was just another reflection of the central mission. It was just, it was just another way that they were serving the customer. Yeah. And it was almost an accident in that yeah. sense. And so, so I, I, think, I, I think you can be early yeah. in terms of timing, as long as, if, you're, if your mission is clear and you're genuine in it, then you just keep serving that person and serving that mission. Mm -hmm. And then what happens is, 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 you know, the cards fall where they're going to fall. Mm -hmm. So there's a, as you were talking, I was thinking about uh, the clients of mine. They're real, they become really good friends. Uh, he, so it's a husband and wife. He's actually the the uh, European director of Financial Force, which is one of the b biggest ERP like software platforms on on Salesforce. And she uh, ran. Uh, she was a director of development at T-Mobile and ran a you know huge huge division. All the developers, and she taught me so so much just about people about processes, about business, even though she was in kind of this corporate corporate world. But where she went after was she works for a, a private equity group and goes in and actually does an audit, not of the financials, right, of the companies this private equity group is, is acquiring, uh, but the structure, the structure of people, right? And that's, you know, she's just taught me a ton about, you know, a person, a, a role staying in their lane, do they have the quality of leadership that's actually gonna make the company thrive, right? I, and this made me realize the, the profound nature of the BI triangle, the Kiyosaki BI triangle. Yeah. I'm not sure how familiar you are with, uh, yeah. with that, right? But if you look at the most important pieces, right? It's mission, team, and leadership, right? It doesn't get into financials, it doesn't even get into product. Mission, team, and leadership. And that is where, you know, her and I have had some amazing conversations over, over the course of time, right? Just in regards to what makes a business thrive and what makes it fail. And it, it's just incredible how Kiyosaki is able to make things so complicated, simple. And the BI triangle, I think, is an overstudied element uh, of the rich data philosophy, especially when it comes to building a bigger business.
You said overstudied. Understudied, sorry. Oh, okay. Sorry. Okay. Um, I was thinking about oversight over it, and I just said overstudied. Yeah. So, that, so, so that's it. That's interesting that that team mission leadership. Because I was I was asked today. I was I was interviewed on a podcast, and somebody asked me, I you know, on a scale of one to a hundred, how important is product selection in business? And I said, I don't know, somewhere under twenty yeah. percent. And and they said, what? Uh, this 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 did <laughs> not amazing, this yeah. did not compute. Mm -hmm. And and my my thought is that product is just like another way that you reflect what you are doing as a team in the world. Yeah. Like pr product is a, is a is a way that you go about serving the customer, yeah. but choosing the product is much less important than choosing the customer, than choosing the team, than choosing the mission. These to me are much more interesting, difficult, for sure. and meaningful Dynamic. decisions yeah. to make. Well, it's, what, it's interesting you said 20, 20%. I would first say that, you know, usually when questions, are, and I learned this as like a, you know, I interview and talk to a lot of people, and I learned that, you know, most questions that you ask are to validate, validate what you already know. And that's why <laughs> I try to pay attention to you know the the questions that I asked, and it sounds like that guy kind of wanted to just validate what he wanted, what, what he uh, what he thought the answer was. Um, but I look at the the answer you gave, the twenty percent answer. I think business is like eighty percent. It's eighty twenty rule, right? Pareto's law. Eighty percent psychology, twenty you know twenty percent uh, tactic. And I and that's where it's like the product. I don't think the product is important. Don't get me wrong. You can't you can't sell something, right? Without you know without a good product. Same time, look at McDonald's, right? It's that example, the cliche example that's always used, right? Where they just have amazing business systems. I mean, I've been to their Chicago campus. They have a whole like freaking university for McDonald's like, to train managers hmm. on business, on business systems, on on mission, on understanding the financial side of things. But I look at business owners that are really going from this S quadrant of you know the cash flow quadrant to the B quadrant. Right, and I mm. think one of the biggest differences, right, is understanding kind of the fundamentals of business. Because I think those that you know are in that S quadrant and get they get a good home run, a triple, right, and and just you know are closing their eyes and swinging from fence and oh man, went somewhere <laughs> like sweet, right? It's it's yeah. that happening. You know, they tell a story about why they were successful, and the easiest answer is the product. <laughs> And sometimes it is, but I think from a, a a business perspective, a growth perspective, when you go to scale, it has less to do with the product yeah. and way more to do with the structure behind it. Yeah. Do, have you seen an example in which a business successfully made that pivot from self-employed to being a real business? I have found that to be so difficult in so many entrepreneurs that I work with mm -hmm. because the, the, there's this big switch that has to happen of what am I getting out of this to have cash flow and the life I want to actually building something. And they're almost, I've seen them be almost too different of a mindset for people to make the shift. It's just a different group of strategies that mm -hmm. have to be learned. Yep. Well, I, one will come to mind, I'm, I'm sure. Uh, I, would, I would say that it really comes down to the hiring that you make at that level, right? You have to hire, like for me, one of the things I, I'll talk about my business, uh, one of the lessons I learned was the importance of culture, the culture of your business, the values that you have, uh, what's in bounds, what's out of bounds, mm. and then setting the right expectations. And then, I mean, there's a whole list of things I can go into, okay? But really, uh, I lost probably 10, 10 12 employees uh, over the course of nine months because uh, of bad, bad culture. And it was, uh, it was incredibly painful. Right, and what I what I uh, connect the dots is I did not know how to establish a culture. I did not know how to operate a company. I just did, I just didn't know. And so what did I do? I went and found someone that that did. And I hired someone that did. Mm -hmm. He happens to be older. He has more facial hair than I do. <laughs> and it, and funny enough, people listen to to him not because he understands the business, but because he understands them. Patrick, you said something to me privately, which was. You like to look at older generations as a sign of what younger people should do, or you yeah. look for clues, right? I was hoping you could expound on what you mean and what you've learned. I mean, I think yeah. most of your client base is is sixty and over. Is that is that right? 
with a, with a um, nice base of like young entrepreneurs too. Correct. Yeah, nice. I would I would say we have a we we did some business back in 2012 2013. Uh, actually, 2012. It, there's actually still business coming from it today. Uh, there was a much older audience uh, in their 50s and, and 60s, and so we we got a good couple of years of seeing you know what people had done up to that point, what made them successful or not successful, and what they wanted to do from that point forward. And, and I would say that the older, the older generation, uh, I'll, I'll give it another example. This was a, this was a guy who's, whose son I knew really, uh, I still know really well, I still box him. I, that's one of the guys I, I box other than a couple others. Uh, but gr- incredible guy, but it was with his father. And we were having a, a conversation about uh, his father wanting to make an investment in this real estate syndication. And, and it came down to the same principle. I said, you know, what, why do you want to make this investment? Like, what's the purpose? Well, I have this money in the bank and in the bank it doesn't earn anything, so therefore I need to have it invested. Mm. I said, okay, so, you know, what are you going to make off of this investment? Okay, and he, you know, he told me, and then the questions kept going. Okay, what are you going to do with that cash flow? He's like, well, I have enough for, you know, what I live off of right now. And I'm like, okay, so what, you know, what's your monthly nut? Like, what do you, what do you need, you know, to have a good lifestyle every month? And he, you know, had retired from some, some uh, position had a pension and a few other things and his his income needs were like 50 percent of what his income already was without that investment and so i kept questioning and i said so why like why would you make this investment if all it's going to do is give you more money that you're not spending (laughs) so again it goes back to the same principle that we talked about before right is defining the lifestyle that you want right and it doesn't have to be this like okay this is the lifestyle i want and I'm never going to be able to grow that. You have to grow it, but at least defining something now. And now you know what you're after. Now you know what the investment strategy is until it's time to decide, okay, what else do I want? Because a person going from, you know, living, living in a, a nice three bedroom, two bath house, right? Making $150,000 a year to going to the 5,000 square foot home or a second home. It's not a money shift psychological shift. But you have to have the first milestone before you can have the second milestone. Does that make sense? Yeah, well, what do you mean by the first milestone before the second milestone? What does that mean? You you have to, you know, get to $150,000, right, to have the three bed, two bath house instead of the apartment, and then to get to the next milestone, right, which is the bigger home, it's a psychological, it's a psychological shift. And it's a principle of a principle of growth, right? And so I look at this older individual and he was just getting more money. He wasn't increasing his lifestyle to correspond with that. But I think you have to. Yeah. So what have you learned from the older clients, the high net worth, like older clients who have been in this game for a lot longer than you and I have been alive? Yeah. What have you learned from them that should be passed on to other generations? It's essentially don't waiting to live until then. It's living as soon as possible right now, right? It's living for living for right now. Obviously, you have to you know be prepared and have strategy for the future. But most people defer their life, they defer their money, and they defer their happiness until some distant point in the future instead of enjoying life right now. How do, how does that philosophy impact investing strategy? I think it helps you actually make better decisions. And you ultimately have, I think people overshoot their investments, right? They think they need more than they actually, uh, well, they think they need a bigger amount of money than they actually need, right? Whether it's to do the things that they wanna do with their family, right? Whether it's uh, to live in a certain home or drive a certain car, the things that make them happy, that have, you know, help them to achieve whatever, you know, milestone of fulfillment they're after. Why, Why do you say that people need less money than they think they do? Because it's all this, it, it's all a process in the mind of what they think they need. No one ever actually sits down and you know budgets out exactly what they exactly what they need. Plus, with all the different choices that are out there, right? It's much easier to achieve whatever you want to achieve uh, these days than before. But yet, most people's mindset is still in the past, right? So I would say, like, let's say you want to go, uh, you know, on a trip to Hawaii, right? There's all sorts. There's a million resorts there. Right? There's different seasons, right? A person may think that they need this amount of money in order to get that. But if you were actually sit down and budget out and actually do the financials, it takes much less these days. That's what I meant by that. So we, we've talked quite a bit about 
defining what it is that you want before you be before you fire. It's like measuring twice before you cut. Yeah. And I think that is like the actual hard work. I, I, when you describe someone else's problem better than you can uh, describe it yourself, you just assume that they have the solution. So right now, I just assume that you have the solution to this problem. Yeah. People, and, I'm, people, and I'm hoping you could comment. No, people don't. People already have the solutions, right? I was telling you about, you know, earlier uh, of this, of an event I went to in, in Europe, and it was uh, a day that was specifically for a group that makes a good deal of money. And there was seven hours of hot seats. It was fascinating. There's only like five hot seats in that entire time. But it was fascinating, right? Because the, in this event, it really went through kind of business psychology, business systems, uh, investment psychology, investment systems. And here's this guy, older, older gentleman, right? And had achieved a, a, a lot in his life, you could, you could tell. And had ownership in a, a really successful business in South America. And he had this, this uh, challenge of raising a certain amount of money. And he, he got to the mic and all he did was make excuse after excuse after excuse of why he didn't have uh, that money and why he couldn't get it, okay? It didn't go into just a very simple switch in psychology of, of asking the question, how do I get it? And it, it was interesting just over and over and over, he just kept getting to this point you know, the solutions from the two people that were running the actual hot seat, okay, this solution, that solution. As he thought about this, did you do this? Did you do this? No, 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 because of this. No, 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 because of that. Over and over and over and over. And then finally, the guy that was the actual head moderator said, okay, I'll write you a check for $10 million right now. Pitch me on your business. And he couldn't, and he couldn't do it. So why couldn't he do it? Because he didn't know what he wanted or why he wanted it? He was in his own way. He was, he was his own worst enemy. All the solutions were there, which is the point of I'm telling the story. He knew what to do. He knew who he had to go to, okay? And, the, and ultimately, the hot seat ended really well, right? And, but, but that question was the catalyst, right? I'll write you a check right now. Pitch me on your business. So he didn't have a good pitch, right? That was there if he was asking better questions, right? The people that were actually from the deal, they were there. He came up with them. Right? It was just, he was in his own way the entire time. All it was was an excuse of why he couldn't, rather than how could he. And how did that end? Uh, yeah, he made a, made a commitment that he was gonna pitch these uh, amount of people like the next week. And, and so it was, it was a matter of like- Well, first off, the, it was two decisions. Are you gonna sell the business, right? Or are you gonna continue the business? That was the first, that was the first big thing. I left that one up. Okay, so he decided to keep the business and actually meet with these people that would fund it. And so what was, what was the big shift that happened in that individual? Because questions, it, questions well, they yeah, asked but, but what, what, what you described is that this person couldn't pitch it because they had no, like they had no reason why. Yeah. It. So what, what shifted in that individual? He, I would think made the decision that he wanted to continue the business. I think that was the main challenge that he had. Should I sell or should I keep it? So Patrick, I, I want to play with an idea with you. I mentioned before that like we need an aim, and part of my what I, what I've evaluated, or like my own challenge at times, is just finding what which one is a worthwhile aim. I think this idea is why somebody like Jordan Peterson has caught so much fire in the last couple of years mm -hmm. because he's he's identified this idea that we're not really happy without an aim, and in our modern world, we don't have any reason to have an aim because we're just like. Food is everywhere. Most of us are overweight. Mm -hmm. like we can sit around all day and survive. Yeah. So there's a matter of we're not given an, we're not forced into choosing a name. Like we 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 are we can be lethargic and still survive. Yeah, it's Haiti. And, it's Haiti versus Switzerland. Yes. So for me, it is sometimes I just pick a name because I have to get up. And start moving. Yeah, you got to make and, a decision. That's and, where it starts. And then, and then it's finding meaning later and refining later. I'm and you, and you can. I, I agree with that. I agree with that because it, do we really know what our aim is? Do we really know what we're after? There's no. There's not this like one. There's not this one thing. It's a journey. It's a journey, right? But you need to decide something and take action on it. And in that action, you're going to experience more of what you want. 
and then you set another aim, another goal, and then you go to that point. But I, I, yeah, I believe that there isn't necessarily this one thing that we're supposed to do in life. Yeah, I, I agree with you. But I think the environment is is vital, and that's why I brought up Haiti and Switzerland, right? Because if you look at you know the history of Haiti, right, it is a, a beautiful you know beautiful island in, in the Caribbean, right? Fertile soil, fruit everywhere. You know, 100 years ago, it didn't take much to survive. Okay, in Switzerland, however, okay, nothing can, not much can grow there. Really harsh winters. So why today does Switzerland survive, and Haiti is is one of the poorest countries in the world, right? It's because Switzerland was forced to survive, right? It's built into their DNA. If they didn't prepare for winter, they died. Mm. In Haiti, you didn't have to prepare. Okay, and I look at today, people want. They don't, they're afraid of conflict, they're afraid of hard things, they're afraid of pressure, okay? But pressure, that refining process, right, is where we learn what we want. So I think you definitely have mm. to go through that. That's, mm. And again, I go to why, you know, I don't, do, would not invest or do business with someone that has not failed in the, in the past, right? It's because they don't understand that principle unless they've actually forced it upon themselves, which you can do. When people start working with you, and my, my assumption is, at least coming into this conversation, my assumption was that these were people who had pursued something for a reasonable amount of time, mm -hmm. and now they were refining and they were looking for help on the investment side. Mm -hmm. And you've kind of thrown in that a lot of them don't know what they want anymore. So how do you help them? So it's subjective, right? I think a lot of the questions that I've asked you Right <laughs> is what I will ask them. So there's no one there's no one solution for for everyone. Uh, at the same time, there's some similarities, right? So the first thing is again, it goes to that gap, right? There's where you're at, and there's where you want to be. You got to figure out where you want to be, right, before you can start strategizing on how to get through or over that gap. Does that make sense? Yes. Right, and then the gap is easy. The solutions are out there. Right, finance. I mean, finance is way more complicated than people make it out to be. Right, you it's way more make more money or made less complicated. Sorry, <laughs> thank you for correcting me on this. It totally would not come out right in the coffee. Uh, no, it's it's uh, it's way less complicated than people think, especially especially today. So so uh, explain what you mean. Why is it why is it less complicated? Because there's so many options of how to make money, especially if someone like a business owner, right, has you know, achieve for themselves, I think that the, the best thing to, to look at is where their skill set is and what they're going to do, right, before they figure out what that next that next step is. Because that next step or that, that aim, the other side of the gap, right, could be the lifestyle that they want. Uh, it could be things that they want to do with their family. It could be things they want to do charitably. Uh, but they still have to figure out what they're going to do, mm -hmm. right? So I think that's first first and foremost. Then it's figuring out, okay, where where's their financial statement out? Most people don't really have a good living financial statement, believe it or not, even really wealthy people. Uh, and, and some and some do. Some have good accounting, right? So it's just a matter of you know sending a financial statement over. Uh, but looking at where they're at, right, it comes down to, all right, how much more money do you need at that point in the in the future? Hmm. Right. And now it's a function of, okay, what type of rate of return are you gonna get? And, and surprisingly, some people don't need as much as they think they need. Or they need a much better kind of uh, uh, tax efficient return. And ultimately you find that a lot of tax efficient returns are less, but they net out at a very similar rate. Net out meaning after taxes, they're similar to a, a, an investment that's taxed at a, or that earns a higher return, but is taxed more. Well, Patrick, um, I know you, you've written a book, you have a podcast, you run Paradigm Life, you do a bunch of things. Uh, where can people find out more? Or where can people follow you? Yeah, I think the, with you? The, to maybe fill in a lot of the voids that probably exist right now <laughs> with what people uh, have have learned with what we've talked about. Uh, I think the book the book took took me two years, right? And it really uh, provides the kind of comprehensive philosophy that uh, that I have. And uh, and there's also an audio book. So I, I read the read the book, not read the audio book, but read the book. So uh, it's. It was a, a really difficult time, but it was really enjoyable. And I can- Are, are you gonna tell people what it's called? Oh yeah. Yeah, go ahead. I'm sure they can just, I mean, pa Patrick Donahoe isn't like a you know, common name, is it? Uh, it's uh, heads or tails, uh, or heads I win, tails you lose. I can't remember the name. 
Heads, or, <laughs> heads I win, tails you lose, a financial strategy to reignite the American dream. And the website is uh, headsortailsiwin.com. And your company is Paradigm Life? Yep, and PL Wealth Advisors. And I'm also uh, an advisor with Prosperity Economics Partners. Beautiful. And uh, who's your who, who should reach out to you? High net worth individuals who are scattered all over the place and need a a, a plan for them to build something for the future. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And th those I would say uh, who are uh, maybe less successful as well. I'm not sure who your audience who your audience uh, is. And how dare and we can we can break script. I mean, yeah, because we, we I have twenty. I mean, I have twenty advisors. So it's one of those we have guys that basically run our high net worth people, but then we have, in our average clients, probably million bucks net worth, 200,000 a year in income. So how do you want to pitch that? <laughs> I think you just did. Okay. <laughs> right. uh, well, Patrick, um, I'm really excited about what, what we're up to together. Um, I'm, I'm really excited to, I mean, I, I don't think a lot of people know the story. Um, I met Tim Ferriss because of you. Uh, at least one of the times, um, and we, we had we had dinner with him in a night I won't forget. You're kind of one of the undersung heroes in in our world because you're kind of behind the scenes, and you think you pre prefer it that way most yeah. of the time. And so I'm just I'm just excited to be to be bringing this to the world. Thanks for hanging out with us. Well, that might that, do. You want to go into that like the whole idea of sure. relationships? Yeah, let's, let's right. do that. Yeah, that, I think that's a huge a huge principle. Um, so one of the, yeah one of the things I've I've connected and this is one of the reasons I I do the the Tony Robbins stuff is is I want to be around I didn't like to be around people I was really introverted growing up and it, dude I so this is totally true story don't put this on film or maybe you will but my uh, so my wife <laughs> I, I'm I'm married almost sixteen years she was like my first serious relationship ever like I I had kind of like this kind of girlfriend when I was a senior but never anything serious. And and so I'm not sure when it was. Uh, I think it was the, the financial crisis. That was very kind of traumatic for me. And I just connected this, this idea of being around people with who I wasn't. And I, but I wanted to actually be around people. I love people. I love learning from them. Uh, when you, know, you learn with, from Tony Robbins, proximity is power. Right, it's not about how; it's about who, and and that's where I've you know built a really cool network of people that like inspire me, that teach me, and and because I think we all need it, right? We're all looking for that aim in life, and it's this never-ending pursuit. But but there's a lot of shit on online, but there's a lot of amazing people who who understand those principles and want to guide and create and create value. I mean, Cameron Harold and Simon Sinek, I've never, I've met Cameron Harold a few times, never met Simon Sinek, but like re, when I was going through that heartache with culture, cause I, you know, had a huge falling out with guys that became my friends and uh, with uh, a sibling of one of the, the leaders of the company and, and, um, and several others, a huge cultural fallout. And dude, it was heart wrenching, but those two guys like, People have the solutions. They've written about it. They do seminars about it. There's podcasts about it. The information for any problem is, is not a matter of how, it's a matter of who. I think my takeaway there is, I think the greatest investment you can possibly make is in relationships. A million percent, man, and, totally. And, and, and it's why, I mean, I, I, was, I was telling somebody today, they asked me what the greatest breakthroughs in my career were. And I said, they actually came through the trough, like after I had gone through a hard time and I was humble enough to create new relationships. And, and when, you, when, when you set up your life to get around the who, all the other stuff just kind of works out. Shakes out. Dude, it totally yeah. does. And I, it's, in, it's interesting. I think we're, you know, if you look at it like our DNA, it's hardwired in us. Like we, we didn't used to sleep in separate rooms. Right, people always slept together. They always ate together. It's like built into us. But yet today, we've, you know, in a sense, we're connected, but we're not connected. Right? People don't have to leave their home and can eat and be online. And but there's something about physically being with with other people and learning from them, and 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 connecting with them. Right? It's one of those other you know uh, human needs. Right? The need for love and connection. Yeah. So I, I look at that and that was, that was something that, you know, totally transformed my life is 
wanting to be around certain people, right? Because of who they were and what I could uh, learn from them and what I could teach them. It's that's where the ultimate value proposition exists is with relationships. I have nothing to add. <laughs> I, I, I mean, I think that's fundamentally why we do everything. Yeah. Is like, I mean, the only reason why we even care about investing as a topic is because there's some wiring in our brain of connecting to other human beings. Yeah. And it's like, it's, it's almost embarrassing how primitive it becomes when you break it down to what actually drives us. Yeah. We're made to, <laughs> we're, we are driven, I think, by two things, fear and love. Fear is survival. Love is survival of everybody else. Love feels good. Fear feels bad. Yep. We don't want to die. It feels good to be in a position where we're not going to, where we're not going to die and we can take care of other people. Yep. Like that is what drives us at the end of the day. Yeah, it's to avoid, yeah, avoid pain or to get some pleasure. Uh, how, how do we get more pleasure, Patrick? <laughs> Take us home. All subjective. It's all subjective. You got you to gotta sit down and really think about what you really want. And don't get up okay, until you ask yourself, why? Why do you want that? Why do you want the business? Why do you want this lifestyle? Uh, why do you want to move there? Why do you want to stay here? Uh, why do you want to drive that car? Uh, why do you want to wear those clothes? Why? I mean, you just keep asking yourself why, and you're gonna and you're gonna connect to something. It doesn't mean that's what you're gonna connect to in five years or ten years, but you're gonna connect to something now. And put that on paper. Decide what you want, and then go find the people that have achieved it and figure out what they did to get. I think if you decide what it is that you want, I, I, I once laid out the five steps to freedom. They were decide, cut out, <laughs> expand, totally. invest, and give. And the number one was decide. Because if you cannot make that, if, if, then you are just guessing. Yeah. And you don't ever get what you want because you never define what you want. Have you, ever, have you taken your daughter to Disney World or Disneyland? I have not, no. Okay. All right. You'll, but you've taken her to some pretty cool places and have her and, and have had her uh, experience certain things that just like lit her eyes up, right? I mean, she has been to Cleveland, Ohio, Patrick. Wow. Yeah. Did you go to an Indians game at least? Sure. <laughs> Hell yeah. I did. Are you kidding? But that's what it's about, man. It's like, and that's with other people. It's with other people too. When you, I don't know, there's something, and this is where it comes to, you know, connecting with customers, right? Because business is about the value you provide to customers. When a customer gives you a good review or says something nice or their life changes because of a, a product or something you said, it makes, dude, it makes everything, everything worth it. And seldomly do people then connect the dot between, maybe, maybe that should be my focus on everything that mm -hmm. I do. <laughs> well, Patrick, I'm, I'm really excited to be yeah. doing this with you. Looking forward to hanging out with you more. Cool, yeah, me too. Thanks for joining us on capitalism.com. Thanks, Ryan.